This is lecture 10 in the Western intellectual tradition. We'll be looking today at part 3 of Plato and Justice, but more specifically I'm going to be looking at Plato, his analogy of the cave in book 7, and then the whole deterioration of political life that he explores in books 8 and 9 of the Republic and how it applies to uh, Donald Trump. And so Plato saw very clearly where political uh, thought and life can go if there's not thought that infuses life itself in the polis or the city-state for him. But let me start with a few comments and then I will move into this um, fuller part of the lecture. There has been a tendency in political philosophy or political theory to divide the theorist from the activist and so you can have people engaged in thinking um, the best, the noblest, the most sophisticated, meaningful of what constitutes a good city, Canada, a good province, a good nation, or internationally, a good political order. And so a great deal of time is spent reflecting on the ideals. Uh, and then uh, as a result of that, the hope is always is the ideals will be reflected into some sort of public activism or reality. In many ways it's similar to Hermann Hesse's great work near the end of his life called The Glass Bead Game. In The Glass Bead Game there were elite of intellectuals, the Castalians. Um, they were grappling with what constitutes at the end of a war, at the end of a culture which had fragmented and uh, intellectually shallow also. The form of education was questionable. And so there emerged out of chaos and fragmentation, cultural chaos, wars, as I mentioned, the need for some sort of order, some sort of ideal worth living for. And the glass bead game players, they attempted to stitch together the best ideas that had been thought and said with the hope that as those ideas were embodied in the valley, um, that in fact some sort of just and peaceful and meaningful civilization would occur again. So in that sense, the glass bead game, what Hess is articulating very much is an echoing in a slightly different way of what Plato's attempting to do in the Republic because Plato himself is writing the Republic as a result of his mentor Socrates being killed in a certain deterioration of democracy that would kill its best. And so the ongoing tendency of intellectuals to try and construct some theory or model or paradigm which in principle at least if not in reality is is meant to when in put in practice embody a just and peaceful states an ongoing tension of the political philosopher the political theorist the intellectual who's trying he or she is trying to make sense of their world so on the one hand, you get people doing a political philosophy in terms of diagnosing issues, offering a prognosis, and then the third part is in political thought is the means by which the ideal is going to be delivered or birthed. On the other hand, you have people who are activists. They're less concerned with thinking through models or paradigms or ideals. They just throw themselves into the political arena, onto the political stage, with usually some passion for some particular issue or a cluster of issues or they see a, a culture um, deteriorating and they see themselves or a group of them as part of reviving, reforming, uh, usually with some fairly simplistic and reductionistic idea, the, the country, the civilization which they have uh, come from and their interpretation of it and application to renewing things. Usually activists of this intellectual type tend to distort the history they're drawing from going cherry picking with certain thinkers and time periods and what doesn't fit within their ideological framework it is just ignored. So between the between the, the political philosopher who's not necessarily an activist who's trying to articulate in his or her glass bead game, stitching together the wisest insights of men and women of the past, and then how that can be brought as a sort of a, a healing um, to the city, a way forward, so it becomes more just, wise, ecologically sensitive, 
but they are themselves not activists themselves. They're not engaged. They don't go from the peaks of the Castellians of their great schools in which only the best uh, enter them and then they rise through the ranks and articulate ideas. Uh, but they, I mean, the irony what Hess is dealing with is Magister Ludi, who rises to the highest level, or Joseph Connect, which is his name, when he goes into the valley of activism, it is at that point that the translation of ideals to reality, um, there's a chasm. And so activists often complain against intellectuals that they can spend hours and years spinning out theories but what do they look like in practice? And on the other hand, intellectuals will say to activists, without some sort of serious thinking, politics becomes erratic, going in a variety of directions, and it really hinges on on the tendencies, whoever is in control with no path forward or anything of of, of substance. So you get intellectuals who are not activists, and you get activists who are not intellectuals, what Plato is trying to do in the Republic, he's trying in his own way, as in the Statesman, as in the Laws, as in his other works as well, just not those three. He's trying to thread together, wed in some ways, the role of thinking and the role of action and the role of action and the role of thinking. And these are this is not an easy tension to make sense of in political theory uh, for a variety of, of, of reasons. Plato, in his approach in the Republic, is dialogical, so he's not going to articulate a, a model in which there's no flexibility, there's no elasticity. He recognizes when you're dealing with really humans in complex realities, in circumstances that come their way, that there needs to be a level of listening, of to and fro, of back and forth, of how do we as a people uh, make sense of this and so this is why his process of uh, particularly the means he uses is dialogical or dialectical in that sense and, and always groping towards what is appropriate and right at this particular phase of a people's history so in that sense there's a level of both seeing and not seeing in, in, in Poe's work now one of his most significant analogies of the many analogies Plato uses and he uses many analogies because he he holds together in the role of myth or story as well of as well as logos in that sense which is more than just rational reflection it's a much more sophisticated word in Greek but I won't go into that right now but the cave analogy in book seven of the Republic in which Plato argues that for the most part people are unaware that they live in a cave uh, they have their little fires, their little notions of reality to keep the darkness at bay. And uh, within this cave, there are shadows that inevitably, when a fire is going, depending how small or large it is, um, people then see shadows dancing, moving off, off the wall. And these shadows, because all they know, they live in a cave a cave world. Interesting enough, for those who want to follow some of this, for example, in C.S. Lewis's work, The Silver Chair is classically Lewis dealing with Plato in the cave because the whole image of the cave throughout the silver chair and the freedom from cave life into a bigger world is essentialist. I mean, Lewis, for example, is very much what you call a platonic Christian. He knew Plato inside and out. And so of the four chronicles of Narnia, The Silver Chair is his most explicitly platonic text and so important to understand how that's played out in how he engages Plato in the cave but back to the back to the cave analogy and so people's view of reality shrinks to a small world um, Plato is going to argue there is far more reality to reality than the senses and that which we can see not only that based on a person's socialization or what Heidegger would call their throwenness uh, they tend to think their temperament, their throwenness, their situation is all there is to reality. And then based on the ideology of any given age, there's often a selective interpretation of reality. And this all for Plato is what it means uh, to live in a cave. And then people fight about shadows which they confuse with substance or confuse with reality.
And the role of the philosopher then is to say, why are you just accepting this cave, this small existence as reality? Your small little fire, understandably so, it gives some light, but then fighting over whose definition of, of the shadow on the wall as it moves about. People divide over um, which shadow and which fire is the best to keep the to keep warmth in the cave in the midst of the coolness and usually caves from for quite a few years I helped open up the caves in the Crow's Nest Pass and led spelunking expeditions and they're some of the largest caves in the world so I would spend days going through whole mountain chains and out the other side. Now we didn't have fires, we used headlamps of course to get through the rock fortresses but uh, certainly what Plato's getting at, they didn't have headlamps back in those, those days but um, this fighting over shadows that people think are substantive and then dividing and turning on one another and the role of the philosopher is at a certain point to feel a certain discontent, dissatisfaction, malaise, unease. Is this all there is to reality? Um, this shrunken world of people fighting over shadows and the little light they have claiming that's all the light there is as if there's no more to reality. So the philosopher initially begins his or her journey by feeling unease, uh, malaise as Charles Taylor would say. George Grant calls it intimations of deprival, that something's not right in Denmark as it were, as, as Hamlet would say, things are out of joint. Uh, they can't necessarily put their hand on it. It's an intuition. Um, in Greek thought, the word here is uh, the, the, the organ of knowing is, is nous or noetic way of knowing. Um, a combination of imagination and thinking, but deep within the heart and the mind that something is not right. And so, but they do see uh, in terms of people fighting over fires and shadows and claiming their turf in the cave, um, the, the, the consequences of this way of life speak volumes about something not quite as it should be in human longing for meaning and purpose. Uh, so the philosopher begins initially the journey by stepping away from the, or trying to find his or her way out of the cave and all the different bypass, dead ends, detours, but eventually uh, sensing natural light rather than human created light to keep the darkness at bay and to keep uh, the coolness at bay and stay warm. And they find the a door eventually, the openings from a cave and all of a sudden a blue sky appears and the day star, the sun high in the heavens and vegetation outside and a whole world of reality that was simply denied in the cave because many people in the cave essentially argued there is no reality other than this so let's make the best we can in our small little worlds. But the philosopher who loves wisdom, philia, Sophia, so whether it's an individual philosopher or others, this quest to find something greater and grander and more meaningful, as they, as it were, pick up the breadcrumbs and find their way to the cave's entrance, in which they discover, as I mentioned, the blue canopy above, the warmth of the sun, the light of the sun, vegetation, greenery, lush trees, a whole other reality that for people who merely live in the small cave of their little world, deny absolutely because they have no experience of it and they also they don't have the curiosity and they don't have the interest in exploring something beyond their own cynicism and skepticism and shrunken view of reality. Now the dilemma of the philosopher is that he or she can go in one or two directions. He can just continue going, saying it's a waste of time to return to the herd, a waste of time return to the ignorant people who do, just, do not want to think beyond a fairly limited, uh, constricted, reductionistic way of thinking. That's one direction. Just keep going and why return? So it's like the peak in the valley. If you go down to the, the valley and people reject you, return to the peak, return to the cave. I mean, this is uh, Frederick Nietzsche's, in, for example, Zarathustra, this constant tension going on. He'll go down, he's rejected, he'll go back to the cave, back to the mountain, down, rejected, and so it's this tension. Uh, Plato's working on the same theme, and so his understanding of the philosopher, do they just keep going or do they sense out of charity, out of love, they have to go back and say, 
you know, I in fact have seen a greater world and there's life, there's light, there's warmth and this little world is a world of shadows you're living in. There's no substance to it. It's like a cloud that does not hold, but back of the cloud is the blue sky. So the philosopher goes back into the cave. Now inevitably what happens, of course, the philosopher will be mocked, misunderstood, caricatured, and then the tendency is to say, well, people are just not wanting to listen. They're not going to hear. Why should I waste my time, my short few years on this earth with people who are obstinate, hard-hearted, not willing to have a more open mind, a more generous to mind, something maybe greater than their little world, their little ego. Um, and so one temptation is this gen to head back. The other is that the true philosopher from Plato's perspective, and, and Socrates embodied this in that sense, uh, they stay in the cave recognizing that a part of their own soul formation, uh, what it means truly to be a philosopher, and this is why for uh, Plato, uh, as you move up the hierarchy of the virtues from knowledge to wisdom to love, um, is that it is in the context of being rejected and misunderstood that in fact uh, the philosopher learns love. So it's one thing to have knowledge about what a person may think is valuable. It's quite another move to um, be wise in how one makes sense of that. It's another thing attempting to apply wisdom with people who are not interested in understanding the nature of wisdom or insight or life out of the cave. Um, but the philosopher faces rejection, opposition, caricaturing, worst case, of course, death, Socrates, Jesus is another example, many examples in history, of course. But remaining in the cave as an attempt to uh, again and again encourage, evoke, call forth a certain level in all the people in the cave of malaise, give them a sense of unease, perhaps offer a sense of really do you think this is all there is speak to something deeper within them that longs for something more meaningful in life than shadows and cave life but also in the process of course experiencing opposition rejection hemlock drinking eventually crucifixion these things happen and so the philosophers growth into love is how they handle opposition caricaturing misunderstandings and worst case scenario um, the losing of their life and so what Plato's getting at here the just man or woman is one that returns to the cave and knows what it means to live in the cave with those who consciously oppose them don't want to understand minds are closed to a bigger reality but remaining faithful to the community to the city-state and so in that sense, Plato, as he reflects on Socrates, uh, as attempting to embody how that works out. Now, the cave analogy is, is, is a significant one. And of course, anyone who has the minimalist knowledge of, of Plato, and particularly in book six and the cave analogy, it, it then folds, book six then moves into books, um, well, eventually, um, eight and nine, um, and so the cave is actually book seven, book six looks at, it's more epistemology, various levels of organs and how we know and what reveals and what conceals uh, elements of reality to us from the world of the senses to the world of the intellect in a contemplative element. Remember for classical thought, Plato, Aristotle, pre-Socratics, reason for them was not our modern notion of reason which is either empirical or logical or mathematical or premise premise equals conclusion their way of knowing was much more a contemplative way of knowing that didn't undermine reason as analysis as empiricism as mathematics but argued this is a lower level way of knowing and there are higher ways of knowing and so in books Six then, Plato is looking at these alternate ways of knowing and how different ways of knowing both reveal and conceal. Uh, this is why after book six, you move into book seven, which is the cave analogy, because what essentially the cave analogy is the application 
of how we know and the ways we know what they conceal from us and what they reveal to us. So he's he realizes he realizes that before you get to the cave, you have to deal with with ways of knowing. But then he hits books eight and nine, which are very important for our time. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, is that the for Plato the highest level of political life is aristocracy the rule of the arete the noble the men and women of excellence the men and women of virtue who have understood that vice is an aberration and uh, how a person's character can be undermined and and then how within platonic thought anyway how are women and men um, s selected tested and tried to become part of the guardian Part of the guardian class. So aristocracy in this platonic understanding is about people who are uh, people of character. You just don't allow anyone to rule a state because they can be tempted by a variety of issues that can undermine the state itself. But what Plato does in book eight and nine, and this is very appropriate for of course what's happening across the border in the United States in the last few years since uh, President Trump uh, became the head of the United States and of course with the presidential election unfolding. Uh, Plato looks at very clearly what happens with the deterioration of political thought that ends in a, a tyrant running in which they're erratic, they're unpredictable, but naive people genuflect before them with no critical thinking whatsoever. So in books eight and nine of the Republic, which will be a mandatory question for midterms, we'll be looking at how Plato analyzed how public life can deteriorate through um, an aristocratic form of rulership to democracy, which he saw as the beginning of deterioration, uh, then to oligarchy, in which you have the few rule who money is that which dominates them, and he or she who has the property, who has the possessions, who has the wealth. So the few begin to rule, but the th that which motivates them is possessions and property and wealth. And so when you get to the rule of the few through, through oligarchy, then this increases the deterioration, and you can certainly look at certain you know, people in leadership positions who get corrupted through money and create, you know, obviously the story of the President of the United States, his story from huge investments to the the game show he was on TV to, you know, money and wealth becomes everything. And so you move from there to democracy because inevitably the people, the demos, feel that the few who re rule distort their wants, their interests, their needs. So there becomes a clash between the oligarchy and the demos, the few and the many. And so there's this tension that emerges. What Plato will argue as democracy begins to fragment and fray in all directions, and there is no order, there is increasingly chaos at an economic level, at a social level, at an ethical level, at a familial level, there is the longing for people, for some messianic figure to emerge, who's going to bring order to the chaos, who's going to give an answer to the problems. Simple as it may be, trite as it may be, cliche-ish as it may be, little one-liners that really do not meaningfully deal with the issue. And so out of the chaos of democracy will emerge a tyrant who becomes a central figure that uncritical people what T.S. Ed would call strange gods. They bow before uncritically this messianic figure and no matter what he or she, in this case a he, says or does, uh, he or she must be right. Uh, and so this for Plato uh, ponders the deterioration from a, 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 an aristocracy through a democracy through oligarchy, through democracy, to the rise of the tyrant. And Plato will argue this is a natural, almost a logical progression uh, as proper understanding of leadership and ruling in the, po um, the Polish should take place. And then as you begin to chip away and negate all those positive means by which a just and peaceful city comes into being, then increasingly you're at the end, ironically enough, back to book one in the Republic, 
as well as in the Gorgias of Callicles and Thrasymachus, you have justice equals power. Justice equals the ruling of the one who no matter what they say, it becomes almost a Delphic oracle that can't be criticized. And so you get into a fundamentalism, a tyrannical fundamentalism of which almost the new secular pope speaks ex cathedra and the sort of secular Catholics as it were just bow down and say um, the vicar of reality has spoken and so we must heed and hear. So people then shut down all critical faculties and the tyrant is there to solve the problems. And this is what Plato very succinctly and wisely understood was once you begin to banish the thoughtful, the good, then democracy, okay, a shrinking is beginning, then oligarchy, then democracy, and then tyranny. And so, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of these lectures on Plato and justice, the very book one and two of the Republic in which justice equals power, and of course, President Trump is very much about power, and justice is defined on his terms that serves a certain uh, constituency or tribe or clan, then the language of justice just becomes a plaything, an erratic plaything, a chameleon-like plaything that can be defined differently every day. And so whatever a person tweets becomes reality and that can change, uh, as I mentioned, from week to week and month to month. And so quite appropriate books eight and nine of the Republic fit in very um, appropriately at this time as the American presidential is, uh, election is coming in Plato's analysis of the deterioration of serious political thought and life. And then when you get praxis without thought, this is what um, politics ends up with, is, is a tyranny of a particular leader and then uncritical devotees who just say yes, yes to their lord and master.